Hi there, and welcome to this week's edition of um, Storytime. I am Dr. Bird. I am a biblical scholar, and I care very much about what people do with what they find in the Bible. And I'm delighted to bring um, another scholar on to have a conversation this week. I'm just going to go ahead and bring her on. Um, Dr. Meredith Warren is joining us from Sheffield, right? You're Hi, yeah, Sheffield. I'm in England. Yes. Um, so she's a few hours ahead of me on the East Coast. Um, and I know there's some people who join us from Europe while we're doing this. Um, <clears throat> European locations. So let me go ahead and uh, share a couple things about Dr. Warren for those of you who are here. And thank you for those of you who are here live and enjoying the chat. And thanks for, to those of you who are watching this later. I appreciate all of you. Um, Dr. Warren is a senior lecturer in biblical and religious studies. She also has a couple of really important roles within the university. One in particular is she's the director of the Sheffield Center for Interdisciplinary Studies. And this particular uh, center has a kind of a, um, <clears throat> a public a grouping of books that like a series of books that are published with Sheffield Phoenix Press. I know that a lot of people who aren't biblical scholars won't necessarily know all these names and publishers, but um, so, so uh, Dr. Warren also edits that book series, is also a co-editor in chief of the Journal for Interdisciplinary Biblical Studies. And I kind I just want to briefly comment on something about this for those of you who are watching and might not be academics. This is a really interesting field, and um, it's a it's a I think it's a quite a rich field, but it's also d tricky to navigate. And so I, when I saw that was a part of what Dr. Warren is doing, I was really excited actually to bring her here. I also just learned that she studied at McGill and. One of my own, <clears throat> one of the faculty I studied with at Vanderbilt went to McGill, and and he was in the literature in English department, and he was on my committee, and I was trying to do a semi in, like interdisciplinary just because I was bringing literary theory into my work. So, I feel this other interesting connection there because of that overlap. <clears throat> but but then back to Dr. Warren. So currently her research areas are, do include gender, which you can quite easily see in the work she's done. Most recently, a book on food, the role of food um, in transformational situations in, in literature in the ancient world. Um, the Senses, which is a recent piece of biblical studies uh, theory, engagement of theory around the senses. Also, um, an interest in, and I um, I share this one in anti Semitism or anti Judaic content issues, early Christian writings, early Christian development along those lines, and apocalyptic literature. And on that, I'm just going to say, I'm so glad you do because it's not, um, it's my least favorite thing to engage. So <laughs> I always appreciate when other scholars are into apocalyptic literature. I'm like, yeah, I will have you on to talk about it. But I, <laughs> So Meredith, Dr. Warren, thank you for joining us. I appreciate you being here today. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah. So the what I what I've been doing, I, I don't know, don't expect you to have been watching any of these others, but you know, when we when I talked with James Crossley and last week um, with Adele Reinhardt's, we talked a little bit about your story, whatever it is about you that relates to why you do what you do. And I know that often when we do this um, on a podcast, we give a couple minutes, but I'm interested in a story, whatever, however much you're comfortable with, because that's what we all can connect with on some level or relate to. And I think it, it's, in, I think it, you know, humanizes this whole thing that we're doing. And I think it makes it easier for others to appreciate um, the nuances and the intricacies of what you're doing. Um so I'm trying to think if we should start with your story. Let's start with your story. And I do have your books, several, your books kind of lined up on Amazon to share. Um, if you want, if that comes up, we can talk about it. I can do yeah. that. So yeah, tell us about you. I mean, I'll go way back. I'm from Vancouver in Canada mm -hmm. and um, I was raised in an Anglican church mm -hmm. and I um, was always super interested in the Bible and just figuring out what it meant because obviously it's not clear what anything means. Um, I remember like looking in the, the back of the pew Bibles and really engaging with all the maps and mm -hmm. all of the pictures and things like that. Um, anyway, when I got to be a teenager, the church uh, kind of got 
sort of a hostile takeover by a really conservative <laughs> group of ministers. Um, That's too bad. And the tone really changed a lot. Um, mm -hmm. And I remember like kind of sticking with it, but also being really frustrated with the things that I was being taught that didn't align with, you know, my values as, mm -hmm. you know, a young adult. Um, and when I went to university, mm -hmm. I was kind of not interested in doing um, religious studies, um, but I took an elective on women in theology mm. with a wonderful instructor, Roshan Namazi, um, mm. who's just really wonderful. Um, and that really opened my mind to the possibility that things could be different, that there's different ways of interpreting these texts and that my instincts that that wasn't quite right what I was being taught, you know, that's that's a real option. Mm. So I more classes. I took classes with um, Fred Wissey, with Barry Levy. Eventually, um, my PhD supervisor, Ellen Aitken, came to McGill. And I ended up doing, you know, a major and then a master's degree and then a PhD uh, <laughs> in biblical studies. And they kind of just kept piling up. And, and that's kind of how I got there. Did you did you anticipate that for yourself um, earlier on in your life? You know, like Absolutely not. No, I started doing, well, when I first went to McGill, I was in sciences. So I took like calculus and nice. physics and biology. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is not for me. Um, so then I switched to um, women's studies and anthropology. I was oh. really interested in archaeology. I had taken Latin in high school. So I was always interested in like the Roman worlds. And uh -huh. um, I started taking um, Greek in the religious studies department at McGill um, and then Hebrew. Um, and As an undergrad? Yeah. Wow. I that's... My, my undergraduate major was scripture and interpretation. So huh. it was, you had to take a certain number of language credits to get. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a little jealous that you had Greek and Hebrew as an undergrad. Yeah, that's I was cool. lucky. A lot of people don't have that access and it's really, it's it, it made a huge difference to me to have early education in language um, mm -hmm. because it opened a lot of doors for me when I was doing graduate work. Mm -hmm. And a, Yeah, and apps for position. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice. So um, what is it that led you to choose, right? So you were at McGill, did, did your graduate, both graduate degrees there. Um, and that's the thing about, about biblical studies too, or religious studies, right? A master's and PhD are two separate degrees. That are, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes in the sciences, they kind of blend together a little bit. Um, I don't know why. I always feel like noting that, like we've put a lot of time in as my yeah. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of time. <laughs> a lot of years, right. Um, but what is it that you know, why, uh, okay, master's, why now a PhD? What was that, um, what was the appeal or the just logical next step or you don't know what you want to do, so maybe I can teach, I mean, just I curious. I just thought I could be like, well, I had this naive notion that I could be a scholar and a student forever and just read and read and read and do all this <laughs> learning. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm one of the people who's lucky enough to have an academic job. So I'm extremely <laughs> grateful for that. And I recognize how lucky I am. Mm. Um, but it's a lot of admin. It's mm -hmm. a lot of admin. It and is. so it's not a lot of time for that sort of ideal. Right. Thing with my books, like my books are mostly the backdrop. <laughs> <laughs> this is, this is the reality, right? Yeah. <laughs> they're pretty. <laughs> yeah. Might as well be like the Ikea books, you know, that they're yes. not really. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It's funny. Right. The, they're all on the to, to read one day list right? yeah. <laughs> or something. I catch them from time to time. Yes. Yeah. So uh, so then your your dissertation is on a topic that is I'm assuming was primarily what is in my flesh is meat indeed. Is that true? Yeah, what? there's an additional chapter in there compared to when it was um, uh, my Ph.D., um, okay. but it's okay. essentially the Ph.D. Okay, I'm going to share that that cover with everyone here. Let me do make sure we have a good view. Yeah, that I do love the cover. Don't you though? <laughs> yeah, um, I've seen that icon actually. That's the one for in Hagia Sophia, right? Mm -hmm. Hagia Sophia. Um, tell us about this book a little bit about why 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 this topic, right? So this is I'm going to read it because I know people can but see it. But um, my flesh is meat indeed a non-sacramental reading of John 6, 51 to 58, which for people who don't know, do you want to summarize that passage very quickly? And Sure. It's um, So it's a passage in John, and John's gospel is obviously quite different from the synoptic gospels in a lot of ways. Um, and one of the ways that it's really different <clears throat> is that it doesn't seem to have a last supper. 
really. There's not an institution of the Eucharist in, go in John's gospel. There's foot washing and they get together, but like no one actually <laughs> eats any dinner. So it's kind of peculiar. We don't get those words of institution. Um, and so for a long time, scholars were trying to find a place in John's gospel where that sort of foundational Christian ritual could have could find a place. And so they landed on this weird passage in John six, where John's talking with a bunch of people. And um, he just says out of nowhere, basically, like, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you're not getting into the kingdom of heaven. And everyone kind of freaks out. Right. Yeah. And so he, he actually says it like a couple of times and, you know, there's connections to sort of, um, the manna that comes down from heaven. So like in John's gospel, he frequently, Jesus frequently compares himself to Moses. So that is, is a parallel there. Um, and so for a long time, there was, there were basically two camps in scholarship that either it's um, a sacramental reference. that's just very opaque and not very obvious. <laughs> um, and it is pointing towards the institution of the Eucharist or it's not, and it's doing something else. Okay. And so I kind of fall on the something else camp um, and part of this book is actually looking at, um, well, it's where I started doing my research and then found um, John's gospel to kind of bring alongside and then it, it shifted focus, but on the ancient romance novels, the ancient Hellenistic romance novels, and a really interesting um, literary trope that happens frequently in those novels is the apparent sacrifice and apparent um, consumption often of the female protagonists. Can you say that again, please? <laughs> <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> I mean, uh, you just made a leap that I wasn't expecting. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, the, the Hellenistic romance novels are from, you know, around the general time of John's gospel or around the time, a little bit earlier, a little bit later. Um, but they're basically like Romeo and Juliet stories, like mm -hmm. star crossed lovers, they escape, they get kidnapped by pirates, they get separated, they're <laughs> like lots of tests to their chastity. Um, and, you know, these wicked bandits and pirates often like take the female protagonist um, and either it looks like she's dead to her lover oh, or wow. they stage a sacrifice. Um, huh. There's lots of sort of sacrificial language around that. And it's really, it's really, really interesting. And so at first glance, that doesn't really connect super duper well right, right. with the eat my flesh and drink my blood. But um, I was looking at the relationship between um, sacrifice and divinity in classical literature more broadly. Um, and there's, in a lot of um, classical literature, there is what's called an antagonism between hero and god in literature, mm -hmm. which corresponds to an association between the god and the hero in cult practice. Uh -huh. So it is that moment of uh -huh. sacrifice okay. where the hero is, is led to death by the god, the divine patron, okay. that results in the the enactment of the cult ritual uh -huh, in right. real life right right the literary example is taken on in in real life yeah okay. and so for that i i kind of used it as a lens to think about what john's gospel does with jesus's identity because i think john's gospel is really concerned with identifying jesus with god Mm -hmm, There's absolutely. a lot of that language and it's a, it's yep. a real focus. So mm -hmm. for me, it didn't make sense for John's gospel to have this really veiled reference to the Eucharist when really the whole point of the gospel is pointing towards Jesus's identity as God. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So looking at it from that perspective, you know, Jesus does the will of the father. Mm -hmm. God is responsible ultimately for leading Jesus to his own death. And then we get this association in the moment of of, of John six, where he says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you're not getting into the kingdom of heaven. So it's a collapsing of that literary and um, social um, moment of sacrifice. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Um, obviously I find, yeah, I haven't, I haven't read your work, so I'm just, you know, I appreciate you kind of summarizing and sharing what you discovered. I, there's a part of me that can't help but want to ask you um, if the Mithraic, you know, pieces, you know, the Mithraic um, mystery cult elements come into this for you at all? Or do you see it as a parallel in a different cult, a different context? Or do you think that they're not re related at all? Or I'm curious. Yeah. I mean, I, I love 
I love the mystery cults. Okay. Um, <laughs> I really love them. I think they're all kind of participating in, in the same kind of um, milieu, but I don't think there's a direct relationship between the Mithras um, okay. cult and, and John in this instance. Oh, okay. Okay. So, but they're, they're playing with the same ideas, right? They're playing with the same ideas about the relationship between like human beings and the divine, about what it means to enact community and how ritual is efficacious in accomplishing that association. So I think they're playing with the same ideas, but I don't think there's like a direct correlation. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that. Um, so that was an, and and did, I'm I'm thinking back to so you got onto that particular topic because of your own love of literature I'm assuming right and that's yeah. part of why you are so good at I would assume um, doing an interdisciplinary leading an interdisciplinary study center that you have done solid work in biblical studies but you also appreciate the value of well grounded <laughs> um, engagement with other fields I always feel like I need to say that carefully because there's a lot of people that do a lot of kind of um what am I trying to say slap happy I don't know very you know not as choose. yeah right not well I just feel this language of not, not well grounded in a mm -hmm. different field before you engage that field right mm -hmm. and, I, I, and maybe that's elitist of me and I'm fine with that <laughs> I mean, it's it's really hard. I think interdisciplinary stuff is really hard because of course, like, you know, you, you do specialization in your own field for however many years. Right. And then if you, on the one hand, if you want to go and branch out on, on, onto another topic, of course you have the training to do that research and to educate yourself because you've been trained to do it. But on the other hand, you don't usually have another 10 years to spend right. like doing a deep dive. Yes. And right. understanding the nuances of the field and to respect yeah. it. Yeah. Right. So yeah. it can be really hard. But I mean, for me, I feel like I've always um, approached things from an interdisciplinary perspective. So my mm -hmm. undergraduate mm -hmm. degree was a double major in anthropology. Mm -hmm. um, my PhD supervisor was Ellen Aitken, who did a lot of work in classics. Okay. So I had that sort of guidance on the classic side as well, okay. um, which is yeah. how I got into the romance novels in the first place. Sure. And then, of course, um, at Sheffield, I'm in an English department. I saw so that. My colleagues <laughs> are mostly doing like English literature from all from all different uh, eras. Uh, right. When I so looked, it's really nice to be in that interdisciplinary context. It really helps. Yeah. I was just going to share. Um, I I have this shared in the description. I have um, the titles to her books, um, to Dr. Warren's books in the description. I didn't link um, to Amazon because the Amazon links are really long for some reason. I don't know why they did that to you. Um, but I did list the titles in the description. But here's um, Dr. Warren's um, faculty page with University of Sheffield. And you can see that she's listed as faculty in the English department or School of English. Um, while we're doing that, I do want to also share. So um, we... Uh, that's a little side note here in the midst of our conversation. Um, for those of you listening, we were talking about um, one of the things I've asked scholars to do is to share with me some of the uh, one, two, a couple couple articles or books that were really important and formative for them as they began this kind of this journey as a scholar, partly because I'm interested in helping you all hear about and potentially expand your own reading um, lists. So when in doing that, we had an exchange over a particular the particular article that Dr. Warren shared with me, which is not that we're aware of accessible to the general audience, the general uh, general public. So here's a here's a plug I'll offer um, for those of you listening. There's a there is a database called JSTOR, J-S-T-O-R, and it is um, it is interdisciplinary itself. And a lot of the more interesting kind of cutting edge biblical studies work will show up linked there. And so I would encourage those of you who are interested in this kind of additional reading to go see if your public library or a library that you have access to has access to that database. Because the article she shared with me for today um, is found on JSTOR. Um, and I'm also sharing and um, in the comments, oops, I just did something that made it probably not go through correctly. Um, Dr. Warren has a personal page, her own page about her own work, um, the hcommons.org link in the description, it, which can give you access to some of her work that you wouldn't necessarily have access to without being a biblical scholar otherwise. So I appreciate you sharing that with us. And um, 
So for those of you who are, who do like having access and knowing where to go, I those are some things you can check out on your own. So back to you, Dr. Warren. Um, we are we've talked about your dissertation and why you got into that topic and what an interesting. I don't know. I, I didn't. I haven't been paying attention to the chat because I really just want to pay attention to you and engage you. And I'm. I am wondering if people were were picking up on and kind of having a good time with the romance novel element that you are picking up that you did pick up for that and engage. And that is news to me. And I am gonna. <laughs> they're really fun. They're really fun to read. Some of them are longer than others, but they're. A lot of people haven't heard of them and they're, exactly. they're really fun. Yeah. Right. And they actually, there are lots of Jewish romance novels from this uh -huh. time as well. Uh -huh. So right. I, Joseph and Asnath is another yes. text I've written on, um, which is a Jewish romance novel. Yeah. So they I all guess. sort of float around that genre. Right. Right. And I, that was, I think that's the only one I'm familiar with. I think I've read that. It was a long time ago, but yeah. Um, just knowing that that's a, that's a genre in the first century, a couple centuries BCE. It's kind of fun to learn that also mm -hmm. to think about a potential influence between that field or that genre and John's gospel like mm -hmm. that's fun so so okay I would love to um, hear more about maybe whatever whatever else and I'm you know what is it that makes the shall we talk about Jewish and Christian women in ancient sure Mediterranean um here's the um I was gonna say it's the most recent book you've contributed to right uh, that and sex violence mind is more recent, but this is the the newest one that I've been like an author of. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. Let me share that. Um, oh, <laughs> I was like, what's going on here? I am seeing. <clears throat> so uh, it's about as this large as I can. Cover too. Isn't it fantastic? <laughs> I love that cover. Let's see. What's yeah. the best way to do us? Oops. Sorry. No, I think it's better. Um this way? That is not what I meant to do. Or that. Hello, what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> I, I had something else earlier. It's not working. Okay, we'll leave it that for now. Um, there we go. Um, love the cover. Love the cover. It, it is very... Um, yeah, she's a real, she's a grave portrait, right? Like she's okay. a funerary portrait. So she's okay. a real, she was a real woman. Um, Byzantine-ish. Yeah, um, yeah, she's from Egypt. You can go and see her in the British Museum. She's okay. she's hanging out there, and I actually have a selfie with our book and her. In nice. the back. Oh, I've seen that, and now yeah. I can make better. Okay, I, I'll go yeah. take a look at that again. But anyway, yes, tell you collaborated with two um, with Shana Shinefield and Sarah Parks. What is it that led the three of you to the, the this is something we need to talk about. Yeah, it was. So this was a long time in the making. Um, so Sarah and Shane and I did our PhDs together at McGill. Okay. Um, with different supervisors. Um, okay. But um, in in the summers, they would let PhD students design and teach their own courses. Okay. And um, it was a lottery and you never knew if you were going to get it or not. And one year, <laughs> Sarah won the lottery for okay. this class, Jewish okay. and Christian women. And um, she basically decided that she didn't want to do it all by herself. And so she asked for permission to do it with us and split oh. split the pay three ways, which was very generous of her. And wow. Split. Yeah. So we, we went about, we were super excited. Um, we'd never really taught together, but we'd, we'd, we'd already been in a writing group for a little while together and we're still in that writing, writing group. So we know each other's work really well. We know how we work really well together mm -hmm. um, and our strengths and weaknesses and all that, you know, we yeah. kind of, supplement each other and say really compliment each other. yeah yeah supplement yeah well. and so um so we set about doing this work and we realized there wasn't a textbook that we could rely on we had to do everything from scratch so we made use of a lot of the very excellent source books that are out there mm -hmm. right now mm -hmm. um and and back then as well um but <coughs> sorry go ahead excuse me when you yeah. say source books i'm just i'm kind of unpacking a whole bunch of stuff for, yeah, yeah. for the <clears throat> for the listeners in case they don't know what do you ref what do you mean by a source book so the source books are like collections of um inscriptions or quotations from texts um or artifacts that are collected and usually arranged by category but they don't usually have any explanation beyond like what it is you're looking at 
in that moment. <laughs> There's not a narrative that it creates. Right. And so when you're using a source book for teaching, it's on you as the instructor to create that narrative and to, to select and curate those examples. Okay. So we did a lot of that work of curating and, and contextualizing uh -huh. those examples um, okay. to create a narrative of, of ancient Mediterranean women, basically. Okay. Wow. Yeah. So that's and what it, this, excuse me, I'm jumping, I'm stepping your toes. No, go ahead. go ahead. It's yeah. So this basically we taught it twice, um, two years in a row, nice. two summers in a row. That's it was so really helpful. popular. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of fun with it. And then, um, we all like, I graduated, I, I left, I got a postdoc somewhere else. You know, mm -hmm. we all just kind of moved on. We, um, I went to SBL and, you know, a, a, an editor with a press came and had a chat with me about what I wanted to do next. And I had no ideas. And all of a sudden, for some reason, I blurted out that I was going to write a textbook <laughs> <laughs> on this topic um, and roped Sarah and Shana into doing it um, with me. Um, and then it, you know, only took half a dozen years to get it out. Gotcha. But we used okay. all of our lecture notes and all the stuff that we had created for this um, class okay. to fill out this textbook. Um, okay. But we did have to rewrite it like three times before we got it to a place where we were happy with it. Wow. Well, that's a lot of work. A lot of work went into this. Yeah. I don't, I, yeah, I don't often think of going to Rutledge, but this is religious studies, not biblical studies. So that makes, that makes a, more sense to me in my mind. But, and for those who, who are listening, who might not know some of the references here, SBL, which is what Sorry. Dr. Warren, that's okay. Um, that's a, it's an annual meeting of people from around the globe, actually. Um, Bible sleepaway camp. But, <laughs> Society of Biblical Literature. Yeah. Um, such a fun camp to go to. <laughs> yeah. uh, anyway, so that's so and, and so there are hundreds of publishers there and someone asked you and that led to that. That's amazing. That's a fantastic story. But also thank you for all the hard work that, that genuinely went into that. If that's more than a yeah, decade, well, we, right? We of had a goal and, of um, oh, our the three of us have a collective goal of trying to um, break down or make fuzzier the sort of scholarly artificial boundaries between Christianity and Judaism at this time. Nice. And a lot of the um, materials and, and non-Jewish and Christian women as well, right? There's, there's this sort of um, artificial boundary that gets put up between this is a Jewish thing and this is a Christian thing and yes. this is a pagan thing and we can't, they don't touch each other and they don't meet and there's no <laughs> talking back and forth. And so one of the things we worked really hard at in this book is trying to avoid reinforcing those those boundary lines whenever we could. Um, yep. So the section on um, daily life, I that's the section that I think I wrote, I rewrote like four times wow. because I just couldn't figure out how to do it. And eventually we did it according to the life cycle, which uh -huh. was a much better way of doing it than like segmenting Jewish Christian women mm -hmm. over here and pagan women mm -hmm. over here. And they're not going to talk to each other, which obviously is silly because they must have. Right. If they're all neighbors and. Yeah. Right. You... I mean, you only have to look at Jura Europus, right, where everyone's kind of in the mix and the synagogue and the church are next door to each other and they kind of share iconography. And, you know, it's things were much more blended, I think, than we uh assume. Well, then we assume in part because of the way things are studied and talked about, right? We're exactly. talking about this and this and this and and people are trying, I think, to, I like that language you use, to make the lines more fuzzy or something. Mm -hmm. that, yeah. Um, and so thank you for all the work that you all put in on this. Um, and, and I appreciate knowing the story there because I saw you all celebrating it, right, on Facebook and lots of posts and blah, blah, you know. That, oh, yeah, we won, we won an award last summer, so we were thrilled about that too. So. Congratulations. What was that award? It's the Frank Beer Award for the Canadian Society of Biblical Studies. It's their best best book in New Testament. Fantastic. Yeah, C so congratulations. Really yeah, that's very exciting. Very exciting. Um, and I love knowing more about why that was so exciting for you all in terms of it, it finally coming out. Um, but you referenced, I'm going to go ahead and pull that up as well. You referenced um, the article that you shared with me. So I'm going to, by Ross Kramer. So hmm. I'm not sure what you all can see at this point. Um, oops. I'm going to, it's hard because I can't uh, preview. make that. Yeah, I can't kind of shift it around a little bit. But so people can see the. That's all I think we can have access to anyway is the first page since we don't, I don't have access to JSTOR um, from home. So for those of you looking at this, um, <clears throat> this is, the, this is the article that Dr. Warren shared with me in terms of something important and formative for her early on. 
And I'm wondering if you could share a little bit about why, what it was in this particular article, Jewish tuna and Christian fish, identifying religious affiliation in epigraphic sources. I think we'll also ask you to explain what epigraphic sources are. Sure. Um, but yeah, what what is it? What did she say? What did Kramer say in this article? Why was that big for you? Yeah. So <clears throat> I, I mean, I read this, I must've read this when I was doing my master's, I guess. Um, epigraphic is like writing on stuff. Okay. So mm -hmm. um, inscriptions, um, a lot of the um, material that she talks about is funerary um, grave markers and okay. tomb markers and things like mm -hmm. that. Um, and, you know, for me, I was reading a lot of literary um texts and thinking already about the ways that, for example, um, the New Testament texts are not yet Christian because there was no such thing as Christianity. So already those right. little literary lines were blurring for me. Yes. Yes. But in my head, I don't know why I thought this, but I kind of had this idea that like, if only you had the archaeology, it would all be clear, right? Like if you can dig something. Oh, you had that thought things. about the literature. Okay. Yeah. And <laughs> Um, and then I read, um, then I read this and in this article, she basically goes through, um, all the sort of categories, um, that scholars have used to decide whether an inscription is Jewish or Christian or pagan. And she basically explodes all of these categories and says, <laughs> there's no guarantee of anything that you're looking at. And I guess I could have like cried about that of like no knowing anything. All the but things I thought I knew have now exciting. been ripped asunder. <laughs> yeah, it was just really exciting because for me, it opened up like all these, like these different possibilities for how people are Christian or are Jewish or are pagan. Like there's not these rules that people are following. And if you deviate, you're a heretic. That just wasn't the case in the time period that I'm studying. Um, and so for me, it was just really exciting to see that, um, that that was true of the archaeological evidence as well. Hmm. It just created more possibility and more ways to imagine people living. And that was, that was just really exciting. Huh. Lovely. And that was, you said, probably in your master's studies that you yeah, had I think so. sh showing you this possibility of maybe the way people are reading things, material or text, right? That maybe there's something they're not quite right. And there's another way of looking. They're more, there's more mm, blurred lines. Than... Yeah. I mean, a lot of the times, like people spend a lot of energy trying to make that decision of whether something is Christian or whether it's Jewish. Mm -hmm. And for me, the fact that these texts are so resistant to that question suggests that maybe we're asking the wrong question of that text. Uh, like like that. if it's not interested in answering that question, then why is it so important to us? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Right. Right. And and stop stop making such a big deal of getting to that the, the answer to that question. Let's go see what else. Let's yeah. ask other questions of the text or of the people or of yeah. the evidence. And isn't it more fun when everything kind of has more options to be a little bit weird? Like that's more fun, I think. <laughs> it's more fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Less controlled, less. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, yeah, I'm. That's exciting about your that release last. That was last summer, wasn't it? That it came out. The Jewish and Christian. That movement. was, gosh, it was. It was a. Year oh, that's right. It had January, to, but we got the award in May. Yeah. Okay. I was gonna say it has to be old enough to be able to get that award. Yeah. I hadn't thought about that. Um, I'm. I'm interested in hearing about your your second. Well, it is your second book, the um, Food and Transformation. Mm -hmm. Um. <clears throat> I am, I think I like it better over here. We're just going to do that, even though it's not super big. I, um, this one has a less pretty cover, but it's it, still. It does because it is with SBL and they tend yeah. to not put a, a lot of, of yeah, yeah, it's a series and they, they don't put a whole lot of money into those kinds of things because it is, yeah. yeah, they're trusting people who are kind of interested in the series and it's predominantly mm -hmm. scholars who are, who are coming or maybe pastors, I guess. Um, Food and Transformation in Ancient Mediterranean Literature. And it's from this series, Writings from the Greco Roman World supplement. So um, Meredith, JC Warren, thank you for this. Also, what is it about food? So this is a jump uh, in my mind, or maybe not. Uh, I had cannibalism in my first one. So. Yes, you did. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Eating people. Okay. So talk us through this a little bit. What is, why? And, and again, I'm, I'm really curious about 
not just what you're interested in, but I mean, that is what's going on, what, what you're interested in. But there's also an element of, at least, at least for me, that there's a push or a drive that there is a need for this in my field, right? Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> And so, uh, so anyway, I'm, I'm just thinking of that in terms of, so what, what's about this? Tell us about this book, your second in 2019, yes. right? Published 2019. Uh, yeah, 2019. Um, so this book, um, so I actually started work on this in my master's and my master's dissertation was kind of on this idea, huh. but I mean, there's nothing of my master's in this book anymore. It just got right. shredded and started again. Right. Um, but again, this text, Joseph and Asenath, which uh-huh. is this Jewish probably romance novel. And there's this really weird scene in the book where the main character Asenaf is fed this piece of heavenly honeycomb by a mysterious heavenly guy who shows up in her room. And it's a transformational experience for her. She gains new knowledge. She um, has a, a physical transformation. She's unrecognizable to her household servants afterwards. Oh, wow. And the, the heavenly guy um, says, your your name is now written in the book of the living in heaven. So she has a hmm. physical relocation to the heavenly realm. She's okay. she's in a different realm now. She's physically transformed and she gains knowledge. She she says after she's eaten it that she understands this thing. The no- oh, so, oh, interesting. She yeah. gains knowledge. Okay, gains interesting. Knowledge. Knowledge. So just like in... Um, in my work on John's gospel, everyone was like, oh, someone's eating something and it's a religious text. It's got to be the Eucharist. <laughs> and so <laughs> as if like no one can do any other eating except Eucharistic Christian eating. bias. Yeah. 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 So that made me really frustrated. And I was just like indignant about it for Good. a long time. Good. Um, which drives, you know, that drives a lot of scholarship, I think. <laughs> that sort it of does. Indignancy. So I started but looking. See, uh, but more- just, just so we're clear, like that's one of the things I'm trying to do and highlight here, right, is that that um, like so many other parts of our world or other fields, that there are a lot of biases mm-hmm. that uh, that are in power, that get to narr- that get to be gatekeepers, that get to define the field or define what is correct, define what is normative or what is central. So just I'm just teasing this out a little bit with you just so people can hear that that's, that's a big piece. That is a thing. And Absolutely. I'm trying to engage scholars here who are pushing back on that. So mm-hmm. just making that all clear for everybody. Okay, back to you. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, so I ended up looking for other examples where um, either m- most scholars had said, oh, got to be the Eucharist, or where there was like just some weird eating going on that no one really knew what to do with it. Okay. So okay. Um, I ended up looking at um, two non-Jewish, non-Christian works, um, Ovid's treatment of the Persephone myth, okay. where Persephone ingests pomegranate and then is forced to relocate to Hades, to the underworld. Um, I looked at um, the Metamorphoses of Apuleius, where um, a character mm-hmm. is transformed into a donkey, an ass, and mm-hmm. only transforms back after he ingests some roses given to him by a priest of Isis. Mm-hmm. And then I looked at um, the uh, martyrdom of Perpetua and Felicitas, where Perpetua enters a heavenly realm and is fed cheese by an old man who lives there. I remember that part. And that's like, oh, it's the Eucharist, but it's not the Eucharist. She it's... already has the Eucharist another time. <laughs> right, that was before she was killed, yeah. right? She got to... yeah. I remember that part of the st- in the story. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. In, uh, it's in chapter 10. Um, uh, I think, well, maybe it's 410. Um, and then Revelation, where the seer ingests a scroll that's handed down from heaven. And a fourth Ezra, where at the end of this apocalyptic um, narrative, Ezra has been receiving all this information. He hasn't really understood anything that's been told to him uh-huh. so far. He's been really resistant. Yeah. And then all of a sudden he drinks this fiery cup that's handed down to him from heaven. And it says his heart poured forth understanding and he's uh-huh. able to transcribe the new Torah, basically. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So in <laughs> all of these examples, you have a pretty specific pattern going on where someone receives or ingests something that's heavenly uh-huh. and they are transformed in a certain way. And actually in three specific ways, there's yeah. a physical transformation, there's a transformation of knowledge, um, and there's often a relocation to the heavenly realm. Hmm that happens right afterwards. So the example that I give when I'm explaining this to like my parents is Alice in Wonderland. So Alice falls down into that liminal space and she can't access Wonderland until she eats the eat me cake and she drinks the drink me cup. And then she changes size and Uh she knows how to get through to Wonderland and she goes there. Right. 
That's so a it's fantastic that trope, parallel. And yeah. No one has recognized it before. And here's a book. And here's <laughs> <laughs> is a thing people yeah. this has been going on long before <laughs> it's oh. it's actually in a lot of places so i don't know if anyone's seen like the miyazaki film spirited away but it happens in that film as well you could talk about um the lion the witch in the wardrobe with um the turkish delight yes um someone mentioned eden i think in the chat and it's it's the same in reverse with the with the fruit and the expulsion from eden they know that they're naked so there's a lot of this going around and mm -hmm. um, connecting the dots can help us interpret these texts in conversation with each other rather than trying to shoehorn them into like later doctrinal ideas about what christianity and judaism have to do with <laughs> eating so <laughs> Thank you. That is so lovely to hear about too. You know, like this is this. Is, let's stop forcing things into boxes yeah. they don't belong in, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What a what a fantastic thing to engage. Uh, it was really fun. And yeah, 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 yeah. Um, well, <laughs> I'm looking back, just very. Um, oh, see, I knew. It. Okay, all right. We're going to talk about it because I would like you to, if you don't mind. Um, the the book. Um sex violence and early christian writings is that what it's called early christian That's text like and are you are you comfortable talking about that i know that yeah you i mean i didn't to it. have anything to do with the like production Editing. of the volume right. but i did contribute it but, but you contributed yeah. and i'm i'm going to ask some of them also to come on this um yeah, you should, see right. if they're interested right yeah. but i but you're here and i um i think this i remember seeing this um when i first saw this cover uh, being, book isn't it and um being talked about on facebook of course but um sex violence and early christian texts i'm just curious what your um because this isn't related to food or <laughs> this isn't related on the surface to what you have been doing so i'm curious i, I think some of the people involved here are kind of in your circle people that you maybe mm -hmm. i'm assuming you came onto the field about the same time um yeah Christy Cobb does um, really great work around slavery, enslavement, um, mm -hmm. and early and talking about enslaved women in the early early Christianity in helpful ways. I think I don't know Eric Van Eichel's specific um, focus. But, oh, well, he just did the book on the Magi, right? The uh -huh. um, reframing yeah. that. But um, so anyway, what is it that you contributed to this, and why is this particular set of ideas and topics sex violence and texts early christian why is that of interest to you so um when i moved to sheffields um one of my colleagues here and really good friends um is became katie, katie edwards and katie edwards had already been doing some work on um gender and rape culture and she and some colleagues um elsewhere johanna stieber and emily colgan mm. um founded the shiloh mm -hmm. project which was yes. housed at sheffield for a long time and it's now an independent center okay um, i'll just you know what i'm gonna pop that link into this please chat, do thank do. you i um i was oh. corresponding with joanna um, this, actually <laughs> i'll have to send it to you and then you'll put it in there okay sure um, so the Shiloh Project um, became a sort of a major research theme within SIBS for a long time. Okay, and SIBS so is my, just, SIBS I'm just trying not to talk Sheffield too fast. Sheffield Center for Interdisciplinary yep. Biblical Studies. That, the thing that we talked about earlier that you are kind of the director of. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, and um, so my work, um, I started to do work in that area as well. Um, it started with um, kind of more casual articles, so responses to sort of things that happen in popular culture and politics. Okay. So um, if you go on my personal page, there's some links to public scholarship and you can see where that kind of started. Great. I started teaching about it. It was around the time that Me Too was starting to come up. It okay. became a very important issue for um, for me to for me to have an opinion on. And yeah. because I finally had a permanent job, I felt able to comment on it. And that nice. was really important too. I had been on a temporary contract for two years when I first started at Sheffield and okay. um, I was eventually made uh, permanent, which was a real relief. relief. Um, so sure. I started writing about um, that stuff and I wrote on Revelation Rape Culture, which you can find on the Shiloh Project um, blog. And it's also mm -hmm. in the Journal of um, Religion and Film, I think, out of the University of Nebraska. And then I've always had this real bugbear with the Samaritan woman. Like oh, say more. Oh, yeah. <laughs> say more. Crazy. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I have like, I have a, a thing where 
people try and like rehabilitate Jesus to make oh him seem gosh. like really fuzzy and cuddly and just like such a nice guy, right? Proto feminist and yeah, never say amazing. Him not nice, right? Um, <clears throat> yeah, and um, <laughs> he's not super nice no, a lot of the time. A lot of the time, yep. And um, so I mean that also leads into my work on on anti semitism and Judeophobia because yes. a lot of that is sort of like unlike Jews, exactly. Jesus is super nice, which is he's, just a lie. Right? It is a lie. It's not That's true. Right. That's right. um, and it also reinforces ideas about, you know, anti-Semitic stereotypes this, and things like exact, that. Exactly. Right. That this new trend, this new yeah. directory, trajectory b- based on Jesus, who was a Jew, but look, he's a good one. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And yeah. actually, Sarah Parks has done a lot of work on that as well. Okay. And um, so Eric and I are, and, and Sarah Rollins are editing a book that's coming out um, hopefully soon. It's almost done. It's so close to being done on Judeophobia and the New Testament. And, nice. and there's some um, essays and, and um, chapters in there about that um, nice. trope as well. Nice. But so the chapter that I have in Sex, uh, Violence, and Early Christian Texts is on the Samaritan Woman. And it's called slut shaming the Samaritan woman. Nice, thank you, <laughs> thank right. you. Are you do yeah. you do you talk about like the the potential Leverett marriage system and how she? It's just beyond our control, people. Can we please stop? And who cares? And why well, is it such an issue thing, for her right? to have five so, men? <laughs> on the one hand, it's. I, I go through a lot of the like male commentators who are like a wanton woman of yeah, destruction right. and how wonderful that Jesus came and talked to such a slut. Right. Right. And then on the other hand, right. we have a lot of rehabilitation work being done by feminist um, scholars and theologians saying that, well, it's okay. She's not really a slut right. because <laughs> maybe all her husbands died. Right. 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 And so on the one, like, there's just a lot of discomfort with totally. this woman potentially having a sex life. Exactly. On both sides of things. Exactly. Um, and so I was trying to kind of um, just, you know, point out that this is a really problematic story to interpret as one of Jesus being inclusive, mm-hmm. because that's not really what's happening. Mm-hmm. in this story. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I, one of the things that I, I, one of my favorite things that I point out in the article or the chapter is um, that her own community do not seem bothered at all by her sex life because she goes back to them right, and they listen to her they do. and they don't make a fuss about how many husbands she's mm-hmm. had or anything like that. So the Samaritans are more chill than Jesus yeah. about all of this. And no one's painting them as being the like the model of inclusivity and feminism right jesus Mm -hmm. gets that instead the fact that they could take her word seriously according to the framework of the of the narrative says says something very important that we tend to overlook and so it's about like you know what happens when we decenter jesus in this like in this paragraph in this pericope what happens when we look at other characters who are not supposed to be the center of attention and what happens when we kind of um turn down the volume on like the excellent pr team that jesus has uh sort of in reputation (laughs) control right the the issue of you know he doesn't judge her i'm like there's nothing to judge her for people this is the point right but the, he the point that you definitely does because he totally the does line of his conversation yeah. is like haha i got you yep you're yep. like you have so many husbands yeah i just i i'm big in talking about sex in general um when it comes to the bible so i keep wanting to like drive home that there's nothing to judge her about can we just mm-hmm. talk about that can we just yeah. sit with that for a while and like you said feminist even feminist especially feminist biblical scholars, because a lot of them come from a Christian training background, are still uncomfortable with sex. They're still uncomfortable with sex being a normal part of life that might be engaged in regardless of marital status um, connections, you know, and it just is really fast. So thank you. Thank you for for doing that. Um, that I, one is actually available open access as well. So I published it in Bible and Critical Theory, and oh, it was nice. republished in this volume. So if okay. you don't have access to that volume, if you go on the Bible and Critical Theory um, website in the archives, it'll be in there. Thank you. Yeah, I um, I was just thinking, should I pull? Um, can you give me just a second? I'm going to go ahead and um, Bible and. It might be easier to find it on my actual web page. I maybe I can find it. Let's see. I'm gonna just share the website here and let people find it. Um, so let's see. This is the actual link to it. If you want, I just. Oh, that. thank you. Okay, great. Um, but Bible and Critical Theory is just a great journal, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I started out as a 
person um, on that pa- on that um editorial yeah started didn't do much just to be clear but i definitely <laughs> definitely was definitely a fan of and love the work that they that they um, bring into the world so or mm-hmm. make possible for others to read um okay i just shared the link to that in the um oh i thought i shared okay so bible and critical theory yeah bible and critical theory.com is in there for um yeah there it is up above um Okay, so that's um, that's what's happening here. That's your contribution to this is um, stop slut shaming the Samaritan woman. I love it. Thank you for that. Thanks for doing that. Um, I am wondering. We're at the point where I think it's a it's a good idea to go ahead and ask if um, if if anyone has any questions um, for for my colleague here, my Dr. Meredith Warren, while she's still with us. We have a few more minutes. I, I Just to be honest, folks, I wasn't tracking um, very well throughout the chat. So if you have a question you'd like to bring um, back to our attention, it'd be great if you could just repost it since I'm... Um, uh, okay, since I, I can do a little scroll back through, see if there's... Um, <clears throat> okay, so... Okay. While we're waiting on questions, I might sure. just plug sure. Kibbs, the Journal for Interdisciplinary Biblical Studies because it's also out open access. Okay, great. Yeah, um, thank you. Anyone, I mean, it's it has a um, a, a focus on um, social justice, so there's lots of um, stuff on queer and trans reading the Bibles, on activism in the classroom. Um, we have an issue on genitalia coming out really soon. Um, so hopefully things that are of interest. Yes, for sure. Can you say more about what, um, uh, and this is new to me, Journal for Interdisciplinary Biblical Studies. Oh, yeah. right. Um, also at Sheffield Tent, right. Yeah. Um, and so Eric um, Van Den Eichel is um, one of the um, co-editors and gotcha. Tom DeBrain okay. as well. Um, so we've been, I, Katie Edwards and I founded it and and then I brought um, Eric and Tom on as as ed- Edit- editors a little while ago and it's been great working with them and yeah we've done lots of great issues so fantastic um you said that the the sorry the volume coming out next um the issue the volume yeah the um, issue the on issue genitalia. yeah why did you choose that what's why is that of interest specifically um well we had um we had a we knew of a couple of people who wanted to submit um, articles that had to do with genitalia and um, we weren't aware of any other sort of um, collected scholarly approach to questions of genitalia um, in biblical studies and it is really an important discussion there's lots of discussion sort of here and there about it but having a conversation sort of together about that and 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 allowing people the space to kind of we also do short notes and so having shorter um Mm -hmm. scholarly contributions Mm -hmm. to something was was a was something that was important to us and we also like to have fun with our work with jibs um and so we just thought we would like to we would like to edit a bunch of articles on genitalia nice nice it, it, my the first thought question that popped in my mind when i heard it is is um oh christophe oh uh the woman who did god and anatomy oh yeah was she, yeah, did, yeah, yeah. She, did she um, contribute or is that no no she didn't um i mean she wrote a whole book on it so. exactly <laughs> <laughs> talking about yeah. the lar- the size of god's testes yeah, i have yeah. it right here actually do you um, sorry, I'm, I, I know that a lot of people who watch thank you francesca stavrakopoulou i i know that a lot of people that watch this are familiar with her work um so i just wanted to bring that up i'm gonna i do see a couple questions so let's bring that let's let um wait um Hey there, Nitty. It's nice. Glad you're here. Um, uh, I see the article on Lot and the daughters. Thoughts on the use of the daughters instead as an edit to cover for Lot. Is this in the collected? Is this in the volume? The Eric. Um, and- oh, right. Are you are you looking at that? Oh, I, I, I didn't I'm not, know. but I I didn't write on that, so I'm not sure. Right. Where exactly. Would be I know um, the article on Lot and the uh, thoughts on the issue. On the use of daughters instead, as in, well, I do have thoughts about that. I don't know if you want to. Um, Go ahead. I yeah, I I. It's really interesting because I did ref. Um, someone commented on one of my just where I'm doing a commentary on biblical passages, and someone actually said in the last week or two. Well, and of course the storyline, you know, makes it. Uh, something about basically saying, well, at least the storyline doesn't. Uh, 
in a firm incest or a firm anyway sorry it's i'm not doing this clearly because it's out of context um someone commented basically saying that trying to protect people in the narrative. And I said, well, actually, the narrative makes it really clear that Lot was clueless. He did not know what was going on. And it is throwing the daughters under the bus. Um, so, and it does it twice, right? Both times, both mm -hmm. daughters um, allegedly, right, have sex with him um, in his sleep. And so both times he has no clue what has happened. So I think that's what you're getting at, Nitty, is asking about wh what's going on, you know, at, um, within the biblical authors own potential um, agendas something like that thoughts on why they would well, put Daphne's them. done really interesting <laughs> stuff on um that passage as well about sort of lot misleading the daughters about the end of the world <laughs> and sort of setting them up her to go uh, out and expl explore <laughs> no to setting them up to then um feel like they were, had no choice right but, right uh, but to sleep with him right right and so like kind of removing that um implicating lot basically in in, in their choice even yeah. though yeah the narrative makes it seem like oh he had no clue what was going on yeah um yeah uh all very interest all very um yeah um, protecting face, saving face, protecting mm -hmm. patriarchy. And Rhiannon Grable's work on this is actually really great as Rhiannon? well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, Text After Terror is her book. Yes. She's yeah. coming on this in this, in the spring. I know I'm excited to talk with her too. Um, thank you for that, by the way. And thank you, Nitty, for your question. Um, Carrie Ann Chrysler's in the house. Question. Do these three aspects of eating the honeycomb similar to the, um, to the Trinity ideas of Christian beliefs? I think there's a, Mm -hmm. The three aspects okay. of eating, the transformation in yeah. the three ways. Does that similar to the Trinity ideas? Um, I don't think so. Um, I I think this text um, predates sort of ideas about the Trinity. So I think it's probably a coincidence. But three is such an important number, in general, right? Yeah. From a long time before. And that right. kind of helps... Um, it helps the Trinity take off when it does come in into vogue, right? Is because exactly. three is such an important number of completeness. Right. Um, so right. I think having three aspects of transformational eating is more about sort of the completeness of that transformation than about any sort of um, Trinitarian reference. Yep. I, I certainly would agree with that. Um, not that I need to. <laughs> not that you need me to. <laughs> hey there, Aaron. It's nice to see you here too. Question for Dr. Warren. What effects, if any, did famine or lack have on food narratives you've looked at? Mm. This is, I love this question. Um, so in fourth Ezra, which is, um, it's in, uh, well, it's an apocalyptic text. It's probably written in the first century, just after the destruction of the temple by the Romans. Um, Ezra has all these series of revelatory experiences and they start out just him hearing a voice and being told things. And then he sees things and has visions. And then <clears throat> um, finally um, he ingests something. And so there's this sort of sensory development from less intimate to more intimate. And one of the ways that Ezra brings about this shift in sort of intimacy of the revelation is by fasting. Yeah. And so he takes some time away and drinks and eats nothing from, from the world. He's sitting in this kind of a field where like no human has ever <clears throat> sowed seeds or like built anything. It's like a virgin <laughs> field basically. And um, he, so Carla Schulzbach has actually written a great article on this. Um, Sorry, could you say that name? A little Carla bit? Schulzbach, I can put it in the chat after. Um, <clears throat> so I relied on her um, analysis of um, that particular portion of fourth Ezra when I was working on the text and she um, writes about how fasting basically removes you partially from the mortal world and allows you to have more direct access to the divine world. And that's exactly what you can see happening in fourth Ezra is that he, he isn't quite there to the point where he's ingesting heavenly substances yet. He doesn't have that kind of relationship with the divine world, but he's got a better relationship with it or a closer relationship than he did when he was eating and drinking normal human stuff. Um, and you can see this with, um, I mean, there's tons of examples where angels, for example, can't eat human food food because it will it'll affect them they'll get sort of stuck in the human world the mortal right. world rather than right. in the divine world yeah yeah thank you 
think there were maybe one or two other questions. Um, we have a question here, another from Nitty. Uh, what is the reception like of this book among perhaps conservative peers? And so Nitty, I'm thinking you mean the sex, violence, and early Christian texts, given the timing of your question. But I don't know if to what extent, Mer Meredith, you can even comment on that. Um, yeah, I'm not sure, question. actually. Um, I um, I know that my, so I, I've written on um, sexual violence in Revelation, not in that volume, but um, elsewhere in a, in a journal mm -hmm. article. Yes. And I know I've had a lot of pushback from conservative um, L factions um, on that work. And oh. so I can imagine that um, the reception is not super duper warm. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, one can imagine that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think um, I think it is actually that was part of the delight for me was seeing those words on a on a cover, right? not just on yeah. an article, but like on a cover. We're not even pretending any like we're not hiding it. We're not afraid. We're just going to yeah. say it. And I think again, like to bring it back to this um, sort of pervasive and persistent anti Judaism, mm -hmm. um, people like to pretend that rape and violence is something that happens in Old Testament texts and right. it doesn't have a place in the New Testament. And so this volume is really, really important for doing away with that really anti-Semitic stereotype Thank and you. showing that, you know, the New Testament is not immune to these issues. This is something that's pervasive in antiquity as it's pervasive today. Right. And we need to examine those texts with as critical a gaze as we do um, elsewhere. Right, and consider the connection, the thread that connects between these ancient exactly. texts. Yeah, and um, and it persists to today, right? Because right. these texts are often used to justify, um, you know, domestic abuse or sexual violence. Um, Tolerating yeah. domestic abuse, yes, all of yeah. that, yes. Um, thank you, Dr. Warren, for joining us here today. I think that is it for now. And um, <laughs> there's some really bizarre comments in the chat yeah. today. Um, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, let me just go ahead and wrap it up. To wrap it up. Um, thank you everyone who is here today to join us. Thank you for coming to hear um, what Dr. Warren has to share about her story, about why she's been doing the work she's been doing. And of course, um, that will continue for hopefully for many, many years to come. But the interdisciplinary angle is quite helpful for bringing in and having a more nuanced understanding, right, of these, in this context, Newer Testament writings. Um, so thank you for joining me. Thank you, everyone who's here live and uh, who wanted to be and was able to be. Thank you to those of you who are watching later. I appreciate all of the ways that you do support me in the work that I'm trying to do. Um, your support in all kinds of ways, liking my channel, um, liking a video, sharing with a friend, um, supporting me through Patreon. We just started doing um, a live conversation on the third Thursday of the month. And the first one went really well. It was very fun. And that's for anyone who's supporting me through Patreon, which is Biblical Bird. That's my handle on Patreon. Um, the book, if you get the audible of my book, Permission Granted, um, that's another way you can support me. The book that I just released, Marriage in the Bible, What Do the Texts Say, is out, and I am currently working on the Audible for that. Um, all kinds of fun things going on, but I appreciate all the ways that you support me and make it possible for me to keep doing this work that I really love. So thank you, and next week we'll be back to commentary on a story together. So see you soon. <laughs>